Hello, everybody. It's always nice to be back to Trieste, and I'm very grateful to Andre, Dmitri, Andy, and other organizers for the invitation. Uh, we, uh, Lara gave a very nice introduction to the topic of iron-based superconductors and briefly mentioned some ARPAS results. Knowing that there are students in the audience, I couldn't resist and show a couple of introductory slides also for the technique, angle result for the emission spectroscopy, and it starts from actually shedding the light on the materials. And this is a very important point because this H nu is actually is a very uh, decisive factor on what you see in the end, although we study electrons. So H nu is nowadays produced by these kind of devices, so the torch as Einstein had hand is now something more complicated. And this allows us to shed a light from different perspectives, for different angles, with different polarizations, and what is more important with different energies. The one of these uh, beam lines uh, from, from this picture at the end of one of the beam lines. This apparatus is installed at Bessie and we can, can cool down the sample to the very low temperatures. And this is the beam coming from the synchrotron, allows us to detect the electrons which left at different angles to the different positions here because the analyzer is placed in the uh, focal plane of this electronic lens. And then these electrons are analyzed in terms of energy. And simultaneously, a simultaneous, such simultaneous analysis allows us to see the distribution as a function of momentum and energy at one image. And if you then uh, move the sample, you can scan through the band structure of a solid uh, change in uh, several parameters. You can, instead of uh, looking at just the momentum energy distribution, you can look at the, uh, just the top of this distribution. And if you rotate the sample, like this, schematically, you can get access to the Fermi surface map. So you can pick up just the top intensity, and then you can get the Fermi surface map. In reality, it takes a bit longer than now. Then uh, the very important point is that a priori ARPAS, depending on the direction of the light, uh, one could see very attractive images, but our job is to figure out what is the underlying reason for that. And this is uh, not always this, so one has to really study the underlying reason, meaning the spectral function. And this is because the everything in our life depends on the motions of electrons. Our approach is and superconductivity as well. So our approaches to superconductivity are different, and I will show you two of them, which are both are self-consistent. One could consider the interaction between electrons and particular suspect, which binds electrons in pairs. In this particular case, this were neutrons uh, uh, magnetic excitation spectrum from the same crystal. We extracted the bare band structure from the ARPAS experiment, asked theorists to calculate what can produce such a strong renormalization effects in our spectra. And the answer was yes, that if one does a simple theory and considers that the only interaction is uh, between electrons and magnetic excitation, then one can indeed get the very high coupling constant and very high critical temperature. Another approach is to provide theories with the positions of the peaks of the spectral function, including the orbital content. And this one could use as an input for the theory, meaning the where the quasiparticles are, which orbital characters they have. And we offer them to calculate uh, if they have a theory for superconductivity, how the gap function would look like. But the gap function can be determined directly from the ARPAS experiment. So we can see actually not only where the electrons are, but where the electrons are absent if the superconductivity starts, for instance, meaning the uh, superconducting energy gap. And then one can compare this and say whether this theory is good or not. Uh, that was also checked once in iron-based superconductors in the case of lithium iron arsenide. We determined the gap going along all the Fermi surfaces with a very, uh, relatively good precision at that time, and uh, we provided the gap function to the leading groups in the field. And uh, actually, we, within three theories, uh, the spin fluctuation, orbital spin fluctuation, and a purely electronic pairing, it was possible to explain our data. So for me, it's a clean signature that our experiments should be more precise. And I will come back to this point at the end of this talk. So uh, as I mentioned already, it is very important before stating, before stating uh, how, wh wh where, where is the gap, one has to really understand where the electrons are supposed to be. And this is because of the shedding light from different directions, because of di very different experimental conditions, it is not always possible to do. 
In iron-based superconductors, uh, it, this, this situation is, is really complicated because of the uh, multiband character of these materials. If we start from a very big energy scale of the order of 10 electron volts, it was, uh, as, as Lara already mentioned, the renormalization by the factor of three indeed happens, but it happens very uh, relatively small energy scales clo close to the Fermi level. The natural question, and how about higher binding energies? Interestingly, at higher binding energies, we see the rel uh, relatively good correspondence with the conventional band structure calculations, one electron approximation. So uh, the uh, arsenic bands here, it's schematically shown here, are in very good in, in agreement. Then what indeed it renormalized is very close to the Fermi level. So here, this factor of three, four, sometimes even, even larger factor, and this is nicely captured by the uh, DMFT calculations. So we know that there is a very strong renormalization, but still the system, according to this um, cartoon, is not as high, not str that strongly correlated that we should talk about the really more insulated. We are not in this regime, it's not just pure metal, but there is a very strong renormalization, which still, um, there are still quasiparticles remaining in the system, very well-defined quasiparticles, and they are living at, at the Fermi level. So, but if we dope the system even close to the half filling, we still have very nicely defined Fermi surfaces, very sharp quasiparticles, so we are far away from motness in this sense. One can call this uh, uh, lower Harbert band already, this, this formation, but existence of these excitations uh, is uh, still there. They, they, they still exist. The orbital renormalization can be, the renormalization effects can be orbital dependent, and this is another complication in iron-based superconductors. This is iron selenium, which has been mentioned already. It has very tiny Fermi surfaces, and if one looks uh, in the center of the Brillouin zone, one realizes that actually the bands, these are experimental values compared to the theoretical ones, and these big numbers are the factors of renormalization. So factor three is not always universal. It could be three to four, but XY band, for instance, in iron selenium is renormalized by a factor of nine. So this uh, orbital, renormal, this renormalization can be orbital dependent. Another complication, and this is another language how to call the Fermi surface shrinking, we call it blue red shifts because this is a different space, this is momentum energy space, and uh, if we compare experiment with the theory, you will see that constructs of the dispersions which are responsible for the whole like Fermi surfaces in the center of the brilliance on the electron like Fermi surfaces at the corner of the brilliance on are shifted with respect to each other. So simultaneously blue and red shifts occur, and this results in the shrinking of the Fermi surfaces, with, which Lara mentioned in, in the previous talk. If effectively you can draw the Fermi level if you can still use the band structure calculations. In the case of iron selenium, uh, this looks like this. Uh, we have, uh, again, the theoretical bands, and we see, you see in the experiment that, for instance, the tops of these bands are now below the chemical potential and the electron uh, bottom of electron bands are much closer to the chemical potential. Another complication is that uh, temperature, with the temperature, this situation tends to come back to DFT results. So the shrinking tends to disappear, not completely, with the temperature. And here I show the temperature dependence of the spectra in the center of the brilliant zone. You see that when, upon heating up, this band clearly moves up and uh, this is rather a strong effect. One could see it in the shift of the energy distribution curve of this peak. And if we go to the corner of the brilliant zone, you'll see that upon hitting the sample up, the electron pocket, the bottom of the electron pocket is going down, meaning that the Fermi surface is getting larger. So if we compare th this two, so the, the blue and red shifts tend to be smaller when the temperature rises up. And, uh, this can be expressed in terms of both energy and momentum. Uh, this is the situation at lower temperatures. This is uh, higher temperatures. It tends to go to DFT, but doesn't reach the DFT conditions so with, with large Fermi surfaces still. Um, still another, uh, another complication, but uh, uh, probably I think which, which is good for superconductivity, that if we are moving these constructs 
from the DFT approximation where the Fermi surfaces are large, then uh, we bring these singular features to the Fermi level. And these singular features, uh, to, when they're at the Fermi level, seem to be very important for the superconductivity only because they have a very high density of states. And uh, schematically, it is shown that in lithium iron arsenide, the top of this band hits the chemical potential. This is schematically shown as a black spot here. In one to two, this critical region is at the chemical potential resulting in this propeller, which is a place where the density of states is very high. And uh, in uh, one, 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 in, in terms of single crystals, the highest TC, the, both of these singularities are at the Fermi level. And uh, yeah, well, you can add up these temperatures and see whether this is important for superconductivity or not. Still another complication is uh, spin orbit splitting. Spin orbit splitting is a very tiny effect and usually people do not consider it, but since there is iron in the system and one does expect splittings of the order of 20 millEV, we decided to check whether this is the case in iron-based superconductors. And indeed, in this material, it was uh, easy to resolve it directly, so one could go to the particular point at, at the K space and usually at ZYZ orbitals, if there is no spin orbit interaction, they should be degenerate unless the, there is another effect. But this, if this splitting could be seen also at the different positions of the brilliant zone where the electron pockets supposed to cross in the absence of spin orbit interaction. We clearly saw the splitting and actually we detected it in all main members of the family of high temperature uh, superconductors, iron-based high temperature superconductors. You see this is uh, LDA result. This is the scale which is predicted by LDA and this is the size of spin orbit splitting detected experimentally by ARPAS and you see the trend is the same. The scale is lower but we got used to that to, we got used to this, that the scale close to the chemical potential energy scale is, is kind of three, four times smaller. In particular, the spin orbit interaction in iron selenium is, is very high. So that's probably why this, this, this additional feature which makes this material probably a little bit different. Um, whether spin orbit interaction is important for superconductivity summarized here, it turned out that those portions of the Fermi surface, which are supported by the spin orbit split bands, where spin orbit split is large, turns out that they support the largest superconducting gap. So whether it's just accidental or whether it's an uh, uh, interesting effect, uh, probably theory should decide, but we just noticed experimentally that this is the case. Last complication, and um, uh, this is the, uh, I'm, I'm mentioning all these complications because the, the theoretical treatment of a system with uh, two parabolas and two circular Fermi surface is extremely simplified. That's why I always mention all these factors, perhaps because they have to be taken into account as well. This is a three-dimensionality, and uh, along the gamma to Z in all members except of probably 11, except of 1111, which is pretty two-dimensional, we see a strongly dispersing band in life as it disperses for more than one electron volt. In uh, one to two, it also interacts with uh, all three whole pockets here in the middle, which is important. And even in iron selenium, there is uh, complications because of this three-dimensional band. This is uh, three that square minus R squared band, and it has been detected experimentally. We did it for lithium iron arsenide. In this case, the scale is a photon energy. Changing the photon energy, we can access different uh, perpendicular momenta in the system. And in this case, we could resolve this band directly, uh, this, which also means that uh, ARPAS is not as surface sensitive technique as people used to believe because if we would take this, this, t this information cannot be taken from the topmost layer because according to uncertainty principle, our resolution would be then uh, the full brilliant zone. We would not be able to see this dispersion. But you can clearly see this KZ dispersion, meaning that the, uh, the, the probing uh, distance, uh, the electron escape depth is at least 10 units also along the KZ direction. This uh, 3D band has also been determined in um, 
has also been determined in iron uh, selenium uh, doped with tellurium material, the interpretation was a bit different, but since uh, the, there is a spin orbit interaction in the system, also spin polarization in this is, is expected, so this band is also present. So three dimensionality is a, another important feature of iron based superconductors. Now, knowing all these complications, we wanted to address the question of um, energy and momentum scale of pneumaticity, which uh, probably uh, one of the most interesting feature, features in iron-based superconductors. And the story started from the multiple reports. Uh, actually, our first study on iron selenium, where we didn't observe a uh, strong influence uh, of the pneumaticity, the, the multiple reports with the energy scale of 50, 60, even up to 70 milli electron volts uh, appeared in the literature. Uh, so we decided to readdress the problem. And it turned out that uh, the, uh, these energy scales came from uh, two initial studies of uh, iron uh, one to two, where the scale reached up to 70 millev and uh, sodium 111. Everybody was talking about the lifting of the energy de degeneracy between XZ and YZ orbitals. And this is a very huge effect, which you cannot overlook in ARPUS usually. So we decided to, now you see the energy scale is of the order of 60 to 70 millivy. And this is a summary of the literature at that time, which uh, we wanted to, to readdress. The iron selenium, uh, high precision measurements in iron selenium actually didn't surprise us because we saw the blue red shifts, we saw the usual Fermi surfaces, and uh, at that time, uh, it was very difficult to resolve the structure near the corner of the brilliant zone. So this small feature, this electron pocket, basically two electron pockets crossing each other. But if we compare this to the conventional band structure calculations, we saw surprisingly that actually there is nothing strange happening. So there is one-to-one -one correspondence between the features. Of course, there is experimental scattering here at higher binding energies. But uh, general picture is more or less uh, standard. So we, we have not observed any dramatic splittings. And this is the lowest temperature where the pneumaticity scale should be the largest. And these band structure calculations are actually tetragonal uh, phase without taking into account any kind of pneumat pneumaticity. Then we went to the region of interest. This is the corner of the brilliant zone. And we asked our theorists to calculate how the Autorhombicity, simple A is not equal B effect, would influence the spectra, would influence experiment because our spot size, which probes the surface, is larger than the typical domain size. So we should see the overlapping of the domains. And this is the picture which came out. The red line is a tetragonal phase, and upon entering the autorhombic phase, the green and blue components should appear. And as you see, conventional band structure calculations do predict that one should see this kind of splittings here. So this is mostly XYZ bands. This is mostly XY character. And indeed, we resolved all these features here and even the evidence for the splitting, which we believe is a true pneumatic scale. So this is the influence of autorhombicity to the system, simple structural thing. And indeed, our spectra clearly show that there are two peaks which are separated. There are two big sets of features which are separated by 60 millev. But one cannot interpret this as a difference between XYZ because the difference between XYZ, if one wants to speak in this language, is this small one. And uh, if one goes to the center of the brilliant zone, then one sees that something indeed strong happening, something happening which is indeed stronger than the band structure calculations predict. So we went from the corner to the center of the brilliant zone now, and one sees that the this difference between the green and blue features are much smaller than we observe it in the experiment. So this splitting is not predicted by the experiment. Therefore, we indeed believe that the pneumaticity is of electronic origin, but its energy scale is not 60 to 70 millev, but rather 10 to 15 millev. Since I already mentioned that X, Y, uh, orbital, X, Z, and Y, Z orbitals are non-degenerate at the center of the brilliant zone because of spin orbit interaction, one may ask question, how do these two effects coexist in the center of the brilliant zone? And the answer was very interesting because we can switch off 
uh, nematicity by heating up the sample above the transition temperature. And still, we observe the splitting. So spin orbit interaction is there, and it was 20 millEV. But uh, below, where both nematicity and spin orbit interaction lift the degeneracy, we observe the splitting of the order of 25 millEV. And I just told you that we can attribute 15 millEV only to nematicity, close to the Fermi level. And uh, we first were surprised how this can be, but then we realized that one adds squares, and this is perfectly fits the scenario when both effects leave the degeneracy between X, Z, Y, Z. One has to be, uh, one has to also notice that people are talking about X, Z, Y, Z splitting, but since spin orbit interaction is sizable, they're of course mixed, and there is no clear X, Z, Y, Z in the center of the Berlin zone. Um, already at this point, I would like to say that Z factors for these two bands are exactly the same. Yes? Yeah, this, this, uh, exactly uh, this was suggested by Oscar Wafik, he's, he's in the audience, and, and Rafael Fernandez, that in the corner, spin orbit should be zero. That's why we started from the corner, and we saw the splitting due to pneumaticity, which is 15 millEV. Their spin orbit didn't contribute. 50-60 was a mistake. I think many ARPES group now acknowledge this. Um, not our mistake. Um, um, so uh, about coherence factors, both X, Z, Y, Z have essentially the same coherence factors. And I will come back to this point later on. So the different, uh, one should, of course, differentiate between the orbital composition and between, between the orbital composition of a Fermi surface and the coherence factors of, of the, or these orbitals. So with iron selenium, was more or less clear. Uh, sodium-111, we also have good data, but this one, I'm in acknowledgments in, 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 in this paper, but this paper is done on our crystals. This is a very beautiful work, very accurate one, which also showed that uh, correct consideration, correct interpretation of the situation in the corner of the brilliant zone, where is a good place to measure nematicity, has shown that uh, the Pneumatic energy scale is not exactly is not this distance between these two peaks, but uh, small splitting which arises afterwards, and uh, uh, energy scale of this pneumatic um, of this pneumatic order if, of, of the order of 10 to 15 mV as well. This was the, the most interesting for me to check because this is where everything started, and uh, you showed five minutes. No, no, I hope not. Um, this is barium-122, straightforward barium-122, no superconductivity, nothing, just uh, barium-122, parent material for iron-based superconductors. And uh, again, we had to readdress it because we, we didn't notice it before, and uh, this was good to do because the uh, quality uh, has improved. This is the overview for the surface map. This is a small brilliant zone, and we can now zoom in using the different excitation photon energy, and you can see it with this kind of precision. The best way to compare with the quality of 10 years back, we had this kind of map from this barium 1 to 2, and this is what is available now. So our first step is always to compare to the conventional band structure calculations, and then to see what is, uh, what is exotic, what, what deviates from that. So this is a brilliant zone. And if you now compare uh, to the band structure calculations, I show the, the band structure calculations not as line the only thing I do here is I integrate over KZ, and there is a slight broadening to, to, to experiment. So these are DF, this is DFT. And this is the Fermi surface of the magnetic calculations, usual DFT approach. Of course, there are domains in, in the sample, and this is the super, superposition of these two domains. And when we got this data, we realized that there is a certain degree of agreement between this. And we thought to maybe, and there were a lot of discussions in the literature, the Barry 1 to 2 is completely, cannot be explained by DFT, and then this is something strange going on. But this kind of agreement was, uh, from my point of view, remarkable. And then we compared the underlying bands. Of course, there are a lot of bands because of the folding. Of course, there is a strong interaction, the gap opened up, and so on. But 
even if one shed the light at a particular angle, one could, one could still see most of the features. And if one compares with the band structure calculations, again, these are now simply integrated along the KZ because we, we, we measure along 0, 0, 001. And one sees that basically all features are reproduced. So conventional magnetic calculations of the barium 1 to 2, taking into account blue red shifts, of course, qualitatively reproduce all the features which are seen experimentally, of course, with, with the present quality. Then, how about three-dimensionality? If we change uh, H nu, I said that we can address different KZs. In this case, indeed, this is what you expect theoretically if you measure near the gamma point. It's, it's just a very small window of integration along KZ. This is a T point and this is a Z point. You see that going with photon energies, you can partially get this dependence, but still there is a mixture from different KZs. So in this particular case, we are not that good in KZ resolution, but still effectively we can address different KZ by varying photon energy. This is along this line. And by going from first brilliant zone to the next brilliant zone, because in ARPIS one, if one goes to higher momentum, in-plane momentum, using the same photon energy, one effectively lands at a different KZ value. So measuring this one, this map with one photon energy, this is one KZ, and this is completely different KZ. So this, that's why one cannot compare the diagonal cuts as people usually do. It's, it's a dangerous thing. So one cannot look at the electronic structure along the diagonal because you effectively change the KZ and KZ dispersion is very strong in this material. But anyway, there, there is a, a certain KZ dependence and the best point to measure pneumatic effect is of course P point because this brilliant zone is different from one one, from tetragonal ones. And only two peaks in EDC are expected at P point and this P point, it is, when we measure the spectra there, one does the same as I showed in the case of iron selenium, and we saw that exactly the structural A is not equal B reproduces the picture. We cannot go down to very low temperatures because this system has SDW. This system has a very strong folding. There are a lot of features coming in which are still in agreement with the magnetic calculations which do not take into account any nematicity. So in order to estimate pneumatic uh, effects, one should know the energy where to measure, and this is effectively P point. And if we now look at the momentum scale, the, the splitting is, is not very dramatic. And if one goes to energy scale, looking at the EDC, these two peaks are basically there. They're a li little bit broadened by this orthorhombicity, but there is no dramatic effect. Again, we analyze the approximate analysis and we extract something like 15 milliv also in this case. And since, uh, yeah, this, uh, I show very briefly the, now coming to the gap, knowing all these details, knowing where to measure the gap, we, I go to the, um, I skip this because this is detail, and we go to the superconducting gap as a function of K. Now we know where to measure it, which Fermi surfaces, and this is already kind of tech technicality, but in the end, we get the distribution of the superconducting gaps on the, on the different Fermi surfaces. We should take into account that there are actually four electron pockets here, and we accurately determine the anisotropy of the gap also in the center of the brilliant zone. Of course, it is uh, two-fold symmetric now because of pneumaticity, but uh, we can do it, we can summarize it here for, as a function of Kz uh, for both electron-like Fermi surfaces and hole-like Fermi surfaces. This line is gray because the Fermi surface is really tiny, so one, probably for the quantitative things, one should probably address the laser ARPIS data because we can do it only um, approximately. And uh, I uh, mentioned before that lithium iron arsenide was a very good candidate to test the theories. And my conclusion from comparison with previous uh, theoretical studies required more precision. So we went for this higher precision. I uh, briefly flash you very uh, 
prelim not preliminary, but manuscript is not yet submitted. This is the new precision of iron uh, selenium. You can resolve the gap. You can see even an occupied part, the gap uh, of two milliev is not a problem. We can see it in an occupied part as well with uh, such an error. One could go to the Fermi surface now like this with this precision without any kind of symmetrization. And we can determine the superconducting gap in every of these thousands of a point. The same holds for electron-like pocket. I briefly flashed the first result, which was very surprising. No photos, please, Girsch. And um, but <laughs> we, uh, this is uh, very surprising for us. This is a two-fold symmetry. So this material is not iron selenium where you have a thrombic distortion where you have strong gaze not equal to B. This is lithium iron arsenide, very tetragonal without any um, big signs of anything one dimensional, but the gap on all Fermi surfaces is twofold. So uh, now uh, we are back to, to the uh, theory test, so we can now provide uh, our quasi particle type binding fit with. Um, um, renormalizations, blue red shifts, three dimensionality, and even with temperature dependence. So, if you would like to test your theory, please let me know. And I would like to thank all the people who contributed to this particular study and to you for your attention. Okay, questions.